Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar and introduction to NeoDB. My name is Larita Ba. I'm from NeoDB, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm jo joined by Erika Sam, our VP of Product, and Joe Leslie, Senior Product Manager. Thanks to both of you guys for joining us. Um, today, we're just going to go through a quick introduction of NeoDB, our architecture, um, some of the benefits of using a distributed database, uh, an Elastic SQL database like NeoDB, um, as well as show a quick demonstration uh, of the actual product so you can see it in action and understand some of those benefits um, a little bit more visually. So we're going to go ahead and, and get started. There is a GoToWebinar panel um, on your, probably on your right. So from a logistics side, you are going to be on mute, but please do submit questions on, in the Q&A box on the right. We'll be answering that uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, it is being recorded. It'll be available for replay for, for those of you that um, either want to see it again or want to share it with colleagues. Um, and obviously will also be available after the, uh, after the webinar for any additional questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Arif. Arif. Thank you, Larita. So at a high level uh, for those uh, on the webinar here, NeoDB is what we call an Elastic SQL database. Um, so this may be a new term for a lot of people. Um, and what we mean by, by that is the ability to have elasticity, the, the ability to scale out uh, simply, easily, provide continuous availability uh, in a cloud environment, as well as provide um, the benefits of a standard SQL database, uh, a SQL database that's more of an operational, uh, supporting operational workloads versus an analytical workload, and that means the idea of transactional consistency and durability. I'll go through a, a little more detail as to what all this means and some of the benefits and the capabilities in, in this Elastic SQL um, database space. Uh, we're not the only ones that, are, that exist in this space, and I'll go through some of the competitors and, and other options that are available for you. But at a high level, what we're trying to do and what I want you to take away from in this webinar is this idea of this, this, this idea, idea of Elastic SQL databases, the simplicity, the scale out, the availability. Uh, for databases that provide operational SQL capabilities. So let's take a, a quick step back and, and, and sort of understand why we need uh, this, this, this concept of an Elastic SQL database. As you all know, um, uh, data, uh, sorry, hardware infrastructures and applications correspondingly have changed over the years. Obviously, we started with mainframe and client server and, and sort of scale out architectures. Uh, these are all been, been uh, possible by advances in, in infrastructure and hardware, networking, compute, storage. All those advances that have happened over the last 30 years have allowed um, developers and customers to look at their architectures and their applications and provide better, quicker, more robust types of applications. Right? And in today's world, it's very easy to create uh, an architecture and an application built on that architecture that allows scale out of, of app servers, right? You just add uh, a load balancer and you scale out your app servers. Um, they're always talking to, to some level of database in the back end. And, and some of those databases have um, clustering capabilities or availability capabilities, but usually it's a, a single node instance of, of the database. Now you're sort of moving into uh, sort of a microservices or a container uh, architecture world where the advances in in, in, in virtualization and isolation uh, and sort of continuous development, continuous uh, integration pipelines has created this, this idea of all these little microservices all being able to deploy it independently, making it faster and easier to, to, to deploy uh, new features and applications quickly. Um, but uh, again, when you, when you think about the data layer in, in, in each of these uh, architectures, your choices are, are fairly limited. You have a standard SQL architecture that's a scale-up architecture, or you could potentially move to a, to a NoSQL type of environment where you can do scale-out, uh, but that does require um, code read-write for existing SQL applications who are, are based on, on traditional SQL relational uh, databases. So th there is this need of, of what our customers are, are saying, the, the idea of elasticity, the, the idea that of being able to deploy and run in a virtual environment, in a cloud environment, in a microservices environment, the ability to scale out just like I scale out my microservices or just like I scale out my app servers, the ability to scale out my database in kind uh, as my, my demands grow. 
and the, the ability to have a continuously available solution where I lose a particular part of my microservice, so that's, it's fully redundant uh, services, so it has no uh, impact on the application. Same thing with the database. I lose part of the database, or I lose uh, a process in the database. It has no impact on the end um, service. The database service is still available. I can still get data. It may be a little bit slower than it was before, but the functionality and the capability still exist. And they want the, the, the ability to keep their SQL, right? You have a ton of SQL applications already written, uh, a lot of investment in SQL tool sets, ecosystems, training. You don't want to toss that all away and, and have to go to a, a NoSQL architecture, relearn it, uh, redevelop the, the application. Those are significant costs, right? So if customers want to take their existing SQL applications and put it on a database architecture that's more modern day. Right, so they still want their acidity, they still want transactions, they still want to use existing SQL uh, infrastructure, ecosystems, tool sets, um, and, and, the, the, and, and a lot of application developers are still comfortable writing SQL. So what does that mean? Right, so we, we talked about Elastic SQL and, and, and the emergence of this term is the combination of traditional databases, traditional operational relational databases that provide asset, provide SQL, provide the abstraction of SQL with the ability to scale out, the ability to run in, in various environments, or the ability to, to maintain availability in the face of, of planned or unplanned failures. Right? So, the, so there's, a, there's, there's an existing market gap where these elastic SQL databases are filling. And we said, obviously, NeoDB is an Elastic SQL database, but we're not the only ones. Uh, early in the year, Google announced uh, Google Cloud Spanner, and then following shortly, uh, CockroachDB announced their GA version. Both of these are what we would classify as Elastic SQL databases. They do have different limitations, so each, each implementation of Elastic SQL databases is different, um, and each has a pros and cons, uh, and I'll actually show that shortly. But um, both, both Google Cloud Spanner and um, CockroachDB are, are viable options. And then most recently, a couple of weeks ago, Amazon at their reInvent uh, conference announced Aurora Multimaster. So Aurora existed previously. It was what I would have called a traditional relational SQL database. Um, it wasn't elastic in the way that we would term elastic SQL. You could scale out read replicas. But that was effectively only for read replicas. But with the multi-master announcement, Aurora now supports both read and writes across multiple nodes, which in our definition is sort of an Elastic SQL database. So before we get into sort of talking about the, the differences between the different uh, vendors and, and, and spaces, I want to walk through some of our, our customer use cases. So the first one is, is Dassault Systems. So Dassault is a $3 billion company that provides solutions for CAD, manufacturing, PLM space. Um, they, they, they are, for example, uh, Boeing or a lot of the big uh, airplane manufacturers use Dassault to model, build um, their airplanes, right? Uh, and a, a number of years ago, like a lot of other companies, decided that rather than selling, selling on-premises software, they were going to provide a SaaS offering in the cloud. And as companies think through what does that mean to provide my application in the cloud, they have to start thinking through, okay, well, i got to deploy the, the, the application in, 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 a, in a, a cloud environment, but I also have to provide the database. Traditionally, on-premises uh, ISVs or vendors would sell their database to the, to the customer, and the customer would be responsible for providing the, the sorry, selling their solution to the customers, and the customers were responsible for, for installing and, and supporting the database used for that application. As Dassault was looking at moving to the cloud and as any other SaaS uh, provider, they have to uh, maintain, operate the database as part of that whole stack. And as they were looking at their alternatives, so obviously as an on-premises solution, Dassault supported Oracle, SQL Server, uh, all sorts of different databases. But as they were choosing the database they would use within their cloud SaaS offering, they selected NeoDB. Why did they select NeoDB over the, the Oracles and SQL servers and other databases? NeoDB is designed for the cloud. We were natively built for cloud architectures. 
We provide continuous availability without any add-ons, without any additional uh, software components, and the idea of elastic scalability. A lot of, like a lot of customers, Dasso Systems, this is a new offering, right? And it will grow over time in terms of the usage. And they wanted to be, have a database that they could scale out, just like their application could scale out to meet the demands over time. The benefits, obviously, were cost savings uh, over Oracle. And the, the data layer becomes a competitive advantage with the ability to, to have no stop operations uh, and the ability to scale out to meet their, their demands. Another customer of ours is the London Stock Exchange. The London Stock Exchange has a software division called Univista. Univista is an application that does regulatory reconciliation of trades and provides reporting on those trades to ensure compliance. Right. So in 2018, there's a whole new set of EU regulations going into, into place that was going to increase the demand of the application in terms of both data and volume and throughput. Um, Univista was running on SQL Server, and um, uh, London Stock Exchange determined that SQL Server would not be able to keep up with the new demands required for the new regulations. And so they looked at uh, a database that could scale out better, and they selected NeoDB. And again, the, the reason they selected NeoDB was the ability to scale out both the, the throughput and, and scale of the database as their demands grow, as well as the continuous availability, because this is a regulatory solution. It has to be always up. So the benefits were uh, scalability, better performance, better operation efficiencies and savings over, over SQL Server. The final example is a, is a smaller company called Move Medical, right? So Move Medical provides uh, medical device and case management. Um, again, they were an on-premises solution that were moving to the cloud. This was a smaller uh, solution uh, for a smaller company, but they still were looking at a way to manage the, their data in a sense that made sense as they grew their company. And so they selected NeoDB because, again, of the ability to scale out as their, their, their customer base grew. Right? It was a memory-centric solution that provided performance, again, continuous availability, and um, not having to rewrite their application to a NoSQL database. So they made this decision. They chose us over Aurora and Oracle. Um, we simplified their, their their DR and availability planning as well as got them to, to to market faster because they didn't have to do a rewrite. It was a fairly simple port of their application to NeoDB. So um, as I as I talked about the the uh, Elastic SQL market in the previous slide, this is a bit of an eye chart, but it's a quick way to look at the market as we see it today. Right. So let me just quickly orient you on this on this. Uh, diagram. The rows represent um, capabilities. So we grouped them into three capabilities, SQL capabilities, uh, being able to deploy in the cloud, and other use cases. In the SQL uh, category, there's basically standard stuff, which is uh, anti-SQL, asset transactions, and the ability to migrate existing SQL applications. From a cloud perspective, can we uh, elastically scale out? Can we provide active-active? And do we provide flexible cloud deployments. And when I talk about flexible cloud deployments, that's um, the ability to support multiple clouds, to be able to support both on-premises and cloud or, or quote-unquote hybrid environments. So that's what I meant by, by I mean by uh, flexible cloud deployments. And then other use cases, we talk about non-relational streaming and analytics. Looking across the rows, you have your traditional uh, databases, which are on-premises in the far left column. Uh, you also have regular relational databases that are now uh, sold as, as database as a service. Uh, these could be both, both from AWS, it could be from uh, Microsoft and Azure, it could be from Google. Various other companies also support and provide database as a service, but they're effectively the, your traditional relational SQL databases. We have a column on NoSQL databases, and then we've got a col uh, multiple columns for Elastic SQL, one for each Google Cloud. Google Cloud Spanner, Cockroach, Aurora, and us. So at a high level, um, the traditional relational databases are great on the SQL side. 
but typically fail uh, from a cloud perspective and, and other use cases, some of the other use cases. Um, you can take your traditional database and put it in the cloud so you could have it there. It's more of a hosting solution rather than a, a true cloud database. Some of the databases as a service does provide uh, elastic, elastic scalability. In this case, the elastic scalability is a scale up. It's still a scale up solution. So in the background, the, the database provider, the cloud provider is, is swapping the system from a small system to a big system. So that's why it's sort of a half check, if you will. On the, on the NoSQL side, obviously they do great in terms of cloud deployment and other use cases. They, they, but how, however, they do have issues with supporting existing SQL applications. The lack of transactions, the lack, lack of sort of asset semantics um, makes it hard to port an existing SQL application to, to a NoSQL database. And then we have the Elastic SQL databases. Um, Google Cloud Spanner, uh, both, both Spanner and Cockroach are, are similar uh, architectures. One's hosted, obviously Google's hosted by Google, Google, the Google Cloud. And so the, the flexible cloud deployment, it gets an X because you have, your, you have to go to Google Cloud to, to run Spanner. Uh, both Cloud Spanner and Cockroach uh, support SQL for reads, but for any writes, you have to use their API. So there, is, there would be some work, a fair bit of work, on migrating SQL applications to, um, to both Cockroach and Spanner because of the lack of, of SQL writes. Aurora, which is a brand, again, so Aurora Multimaster, which is a new announcement. Um, it's still not GA, it's still in sort of preview, um, but looking at it, it's, it's, it looks pretty close to the new ODB. Again, the, the differences between us and, and Aurora would be the fact that um, you have to use Amazon to get Aurora, uh, whereas a lot of our customers uh, want the flexibility of running new ODB both either on-premises, in their own private clouds, uh, in AWS or Azure or across multiple clouds to, to protect them against uh, cloud um, vendor failures. So that's sort of been uh, a quick summary of, of the market and where we fit in the market and the differences between us and, uh, and some of the other vendors in this space. Just drilling down briefly into what is NeoDB and, and, and how we're different from a traditional database, right? So as I said, we were built for the cloud. What does that mean? What that means is we've taken a traditional database architecture. So uh, in, in this diagram, the left side rep represents a standard relational database. Basically, it's a single process that runs on a server that both controls um, SQL processing, SQL management, and storage management all in one uh, process or, or set of multiple processes that run on a single box. We took that system and broke it up into multiple services. So NeoDB is actually comprised of two separate services. The first service is our transaction layer, right? This layer is a fully in-memory transaction processing engine. You can think of it as an in-memory database, like Volt or Times 10 or another in-memory database. It's fully distributed. It can be scaled out and in dynamically but it has no data persistence. It does not store data to disk. That is handled by the second service in UODB, which is called our storage managers. Our storage managers maintain persistence of that data in, within a, a, in a single region or multiple regions. The data could be fully copies or it could also be sharded. So you have a lot of flexibility in how you set up your data store. Both these layers can be scaled independently of each other. So for a read heavy or read mostly workload, you can scale out your transactions and engines to meet your workloads independently of the storage layer. If you've got a write heavy workload, you can scale out your storage layer to get better IO for write heavy workloads, right? So NeoDB gives you a lot of flexibility in how to manage and architect and deploy applications, both on microservices. Each of these services can be fully containerized and put into a, a cloud platform, as well as um, being able to architect it to meet the workloads that you need by scaling out. So you can easily add nodes or remove nodes in this architecture. What makes this possible is what we call our durable distributed cache. 
So everything that we've built within UODB is based on memory, right? So we've got a fully in-memory database, uh, database at the transaction layer, right? It puts the, the data close to the applications. You could deploy these transaction engines close or uh, right beside your application for low latency access. But the data is also durable, right? That is, that is the key point of, of NeoDB. We are a full assets database. We're consistent and we're durable. Right, so the data can be made durable on a single node, multiple nodes, single single zone, multiple zones. Right, that durability provides safety in case of uh, both single node data center uh, failures. This is a, a quick logical diagram of NeoDB. Um, at, so looking outside in at the very top, we support standard JDBC ODBC interfaces, right? So any SQL application that runs through JDBC ODBC can use our drivers to connect up to new ODB, right? So we are a fully ANSI SQL uh, database that works through standard JDBC ODBC protocols. Our management layer is fully RESTful, right? So you could use our command line capabilities to manage the database, or you can integrate it with your own uh, management tools through our RESTful calls. Right, so the database consists of, like I talked about, the transaction engines, which is the, the stateless, tran stateless transaction processing. Right, it is fully ANSI SQL distributed and provides um, um, cache management, in-memory cache management of the data. And then our storage processes, which manage the data on disk. And the third process that's within the architecture is what we call our administration layer. This is the layer that manages this distributed environment as a single logical database. From an application perspective, right, we look like a single database even though we are distributed across multiple nodes. The applications connect up to any one of our transaction engines that can access all the data. Right? There, there is no head node, there is no one node that the, the applications need to connect up to. So uh, this is a, again a network view, as, as I mentioned. Um, the applications at the top here can connect up to any one of the transaction engines. There's no head node, no master node. Uh, an application connects, and because the, the transaction engines are fully in memory, they start building up their caches based on application workload. So you could have some different types of application workloads coming in to different transaction engines, and they could be managing totally different data sets. Right? You could have a uh, for example, if you wanted to do a, a little bit of analytics against this data, you could run a, a transaction engine on a larger, more mem a lot more memory system and have a dashboard or a BI tool work uh, at, against that transaction engine accessing the data that's available in real time. Right? So we support what, is, what Gartner calls HTAP, which is hybrid transactional analytical processing, so the ability to do both operational workloads as well as what I call operational analytics which are quick analytics or dashboard style views of the data. So that was a, a quick summary of, of the market of NeoDB's architecture. Um, I'm gonna pass this on to, to, to Joe uh, to, to walk you through a, a demonstration, but just very quickly, just to give you a, an overview of what that demonstration is gonna be. We're gonna deploy a database across three availability zones. Um, we're going to have an application connect up to it and show you that uh, in the case of a single node or availability zone failure, the application keeps running. And we will also show how to scale out, how easy, easy it is to scale that database back out in the case of failures. Joe? Great. Thank you, Arif. Hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Okay, great. All right, we're going to go ahead and proceed uh, with the demo. Uh, as, as Arif mentioned, we're going to go ahead and deploy a database across multiple regions. Uh, we're just going to bring up a command to help us do that. Uh, this is a, a NoDB uh, script that's going to deploy across three zones. And uh, in those three zones, we're going to choose today to, uh, that two of them uh, will have storage manager uh, processes running. So those, those are the ones that persist the database to disk. So we'll have uh, two copies of the database, so we'll um, we'll have redundancy there in, in the event of a failure. Our database name is test. 
and we're, um, our username is DBA and our password is goalie. Um, and we're going to go ahead and deploy that environment. So we're off now uh, creating the uh, admin service containers that are going to manage the domain. As Arif had mentioned, this is the portion that's going to um, manage the database processes um, in, in the different zones and present the database as a single database. Uh, we can see the script is now busy creating the storage managers and the transaction engines in each of the zones. Uh, so we see here it's created zone one. We have a storage manager and a TE. We've created zone two. We also have a storage manager and a TE. And in the third zone, uh, we just have a, a single TE. Uh, so uh, while I've been describing the environment, uh, let's um, let's go ahead and see what we built uh, together. So if I run a, a show domain command, um, we see we have the administration layer here, and it's showing our, our three different zones that they're all connected and active. And then on the database layer, uh, in the lower portion of the command, we see that we have uh, a, a TE and an SM in in zone one, and we have a storage manager and a TE in zone two, and likewise, uh, we, well, we see we have a transaction engine in, in zone three. Um, so what we will also want to take note is um, the transaction engines in each one of our zones. In, in zone one, we have a transaction engine called TE1, in zone two, it's called TE3, and in zone three, it's called TE4. This is going to be important because when we run our application, we'll come over here and we're going to run a sample application today. Um, and what I'd like to demonstrate for you is how we can prioritize uh, which zone we're going to connect to. So this is a small application. It runs a little SQL, but one of the things it's going to do for us is it's going to uh, display the transaction engine that it connected to. And you'll notice that we're prioritizing zone three today. And um, if for some reason uh, there is a failure and we can't connect to a transaction engine in zone three, then uh, within my priority chain, uh, I'm just then saying connect to any zone. So you'll notice the zone star. Um, so let's go ahead and run this command. And, uh, if we go back to our display, um, we would expect, since we're prioritizing zone three, that it would be connecting to the TE4. And if you look to the left, uh, you'll notice the application is running and processing uh, connection requests and running the SQL. And it is, of course, um, always connecting to transaction engine number four, because that, that's exactly what we asked it to do. Um, but let's go ahead and um, uh, re remove zone three. So we'll sort of simulate um, a, a little failure scenario. Uh, so we'll shut down zone three. Okay. So we've just removed zone three. And if you look quickly to the left, you'll notice that the application has not missed a beat. It continues to process SQL connections and run SQL. Um, but you'll see it's, it's uh, alternating now uh, between um, transaction engine one and transaction engine three, which we know to be in the other two zones. Um, so this demonstrates the, um, the full redundancy of uh, transaction engines and the resiliency of the system that we, um, we have taken a failure, uh, yet we continue to process the, this, the connections in SQL. Let's, let's continue with that. And we'll go ahead and remove the second zone, which is still OK, because we still have one zone left. So even in a double failure scenario, and uh, let's go ahead and display our, um, our domain. And we can see, in fact, that only zone one is, is currently up and running. Uh, but you'll notice that the database is indicated as uh, it's, it's up and running, so it's healthy and it continues to process SQL. And to the left, uh, as we would expect, uh, we see that it's now constantly connecting to transaction engine number one, uh, which we know to be in zone number one. Likewise, we can now scale uh, out um, our database 
and add those back, and we'll see that the application will will start to automatically uh, take advantage of the um, the rest of the zones as they become available. So let's go ahead and bring up uh, zone number two. So I'm going to bring up uh, the zones in that are responding in in uh, New Admin two. Uh, so so we're going to see now that uh, as that comes online, let's do a show command, and we can see it's already on loan uh, online. And zone two, its transaction engine, its new transaction engine is called um, TE six. If we look to the left, we see our application is now already taking advantage of it. It's, it's up and running and available, uh, and the application is now switching between TE1 and TE6 uh, to service all connection and SQL requests. Finally, we'll go ahead and bring up our, our third zone and restore our database back to its, its full, it's full uh, here we go, it's, now it's fully up and running. As we can see that we have all three zones running, and zone three, we added transaction engine uh, number eight. So um, as we would expect, since our load balancer prioritized zone three, the only transaction engine we're connecting to now is transaction engine number eight. So uh, that's just a quick example uh, today of showing how we could quickly deploy new ODB in a uh, containerized deployment model. Uh, we also showed uh, resiliency as we inserted a couple of scenario, uh, failure scenarios, and we showed that the database uh, continued to process connection requests and SQLs um, with, without failure. And then we scaled, uh, we, you know, in that we showed scale in and scale out capabilities, bringing our database back to its, its full, um, full processing uh, power. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I, this is Arif again. I just wanted to point out a couple things of, of Joe's demo, which I think he, he talked about, but uh, I just want to reinforce this. One of the things that Joe showed at the very, very beginning was how easy it was to deploy NeoDB using containers very quickly and very easily. It took, what, maybe 30 seconds to deploy across three zones a set of transaction engines and SMs that were ready to serve an application. So if you think about your architectures, you think about uh, where you're going from a microservices perspective, the ability to quickly deploy a microservice with its database in a, a CDCI pipeline is significant. And NeoDB allows you to do that very quickly and very easily, all scripted through, through just standard REST calls. Okay? The other thing that Joe showed was, as he mentioned, the resiliency to failure. Right? We showed a two failure scenario, two node, sorry, two uh, failure scenario where you lost both zone three and zone two. And even though you've got two failure modes, the application continues to run because there is still re built-in redundancy uh, in the system. Yes, it may not perform as, as, as well as it did in, in full deployment, but that is to be expected. And then what Joe showed was, again, how you scale that back out took literally seconds. And from the application's perspective, it doesn't understand what's going on, right? We look like a single logical database that the application can connect up to and get, at, get data from. Thanks, Joe. Great, you're welcome, Marie. My pleasure. So just to, to summarize, um, who is NeoDB? We've been around since 2010. Uh, we still consider ourselves a startup. We are a seven-year-old startup, but it takes a long time to create a, a SQL database. Right? It is, to get a SQL database correct is not a couple years worth of work. And we've been around and we've been doing this for, for, for seven years, providing a, an active, active, multi-master distributed database to our customers. The management team, myself, and everybody else on the team has been around databases for decades. Um, we all come from database backgrounds, so we understand the challenges of creating a database. Uh, obviously, this is a patent SQL um, uh, system, and a lot of SaaS providers, as I mentioned, is, is, are running with us. And a sample of our customers, uh, I talked through Dassault Systems, 
I talked through the uh, London Stock Exchange, but there's others on this list um, that are notable uh, customers using our systems in production and uh, for various different use cases. We are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We also have an office in, in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, so we are a distributed company. And, and, and as well as London, thank you. Great. So um, so now is a great time for, for questions. We've had a couple that have come in through the course of the webinar, but please feel free to go ahead and submit your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel um, over to your right. There is a question box there. Um, so the first question is, what deployment environments can know to be run in? So uh, it's one, of, one of my, my ideas of being a cloud database is not just the fact that we run in cloud, it's more the flexibility of where you can run. So NeoDB um, supports a wide variety of deployment platforms. Obviously, we support physical hardware. We have a number of customers running our processes on physical hardware, dedicated servers. Um, they do that for very uh, for performance reasons uh, and also just because that's the, their deployment model. <clears throat> we also support uh, virtual environments, both VMware as well as containers. We have customers running containers in production today. Now with NeoDB, and then from a from a uh, deployment perspective, so that's sort of the environment. From a deployment, we run in on premises, either on private clouds or on physical hardware, uh, as well as uh, public clouds. We support Azure, we support AWS, um, and we will soon support. Actually, we do support uh, Google Cloud Platform. <clears throat> Sorry. Great. Thanks, Sari. The second question that we have here is, uh, what is the minimum configuration needed to have a running database? Um, yes, uh, so for a minimum configuration, um, actually no ODB can run on a single host. Um, so again, it has that great flexibility of running in a single host all the way to the, the multi-host environments and cloud deployments that Arif has spoken about. As far as uh, minimal requirements, uh, you can run new ODB uh, on, on a um, uh, you know single host um, server with um, uh, you know uh, four core processors and and probably minimum of uh, eight gig of RAM and you're ready to go and you can you can run. Uh, we of course would then deploy up um, as we scale out um, to support much larger applications. Um, the whole idea is the scale out. Uh, we can run on commodity small hardware once you put it all together. Uh, in a, um, a multi-node deployment, you create a very powerful system. Great. Um, how often are new to these customers uh, migrating a SQL app versus, you know, creating brand new, brand new applications? That's a, that's a great question. Um, our target market is customers with existing SQL applications that want to modernize their architecture. They want to modernize to a cloud or a microservices type of environment. So majority of our customers are migrating from existing SQL applications to, <clears throat> to new ODB. We do have customers deploying new applications. Um, these are new applications that uh, they want to deploy on new ODB because they've got existing SQL skills and they've got familiarity with, with SQL environments. And so they want to maintain that. Um, they don't want to relearn NoSQL. Um, but I would say in general, most of our customers are customers with existing SQL applications that want to migrate to to modern applications, but we do support new new development. Great. So, so actually, a very specific question along those lines um, is: if I have a web app written in PGPL SQL and I want to migrate my database to NoDB, what are the transition costs? How much would I need to refactor SQL wise? Right. So that's, again, great question. Um, from a client SQL perspective, we are anti-compliant. Um, so. Uh, we've had customers migrate their application in a matter of days and in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but depending on the application and how much of sort of the proprietary database uh, SQL syntax you're using, uh, there will be some migration costs on migrating those, those uh, SQL calls to more ANSI standard SQL calls. From the perspective of store procedures and, and other things like that, um, we support store procedures, SQL and Java store procedures. Um, there will be a cost and, and time required to, to migrate and convert PL SQL or T SQL store procedures 
to a, a SQL or, or Java store procedure, but those but those costs are the same regardless if you migrate from uh, the existing database to any other database. Right? It, it's unfortunately uh, proprietary extensions of any database vendors is sort of a lock-in to that database vendor, and there's no there's no magic bullet for that. Um, uh, another question here is, you know, if I have uh, multiple customers who I need to have the, the data separate, how capable is the is the database to support that kind of configuration? Yep. Uh, so we refer to that as sort of a multi-tenant uh, database. Uh, you can do multi-tenancy in, in a, a large, uh, quite a number of ways within your DB. Uh, within a single single database, you could have obviously schemas or, or multiple tables that are that are separated out by um, by vendor or sorry customer. You could also deploy multiple databases in a single logical environment within your DB, and each customer maintains each customer has its own separate database, and that would be a set of transaction engines and storage managers dedicated to that tenant. Um, depending on how you want to manage the data and, and, and sort of uh, manage your application, we can support a wide variety of multi-tenant type of environments. Great. Um, so I, we were trying to end right at uh, about 45 minutes, so I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to uh, respond to the email that we'll be sending tomorrow that has a link to this webinar um, for, for your your uh, background um, and and definitely take a look through and take a look at the demonstration that you see here um, or consider downloading the community edition the community edition is a three transaction engine one storage manager configuration so it has the ability to scale out um, uh, to multiple transaction engines and multiple nodes you can test the continuous availability that way you can test the scale out um, though obviously it's missing the, uh, the, the redundancy on the storage side so um, please definitely take a look through that, uh, and we will follow up with any additional questions that uh, we haven't had the chance to get to. Now, thanks so much for your time today. Um, hope that you found this uh, introduction to new ODB uh, helpful. Um, if you have you know, colleagues that are interested in learning more, we plan to be running these webinars on a monthly basis, uh, and you know, certainly keep an eye out for that as well. In the meantime, have a great Wednesday, and we will talk to you another time.